start again. Okay, let's uh, let's see if this is going to work. I tried this last night at home and it seemed to be all right. Uh -huh. but, uh, <coughs> Uh, okay, uh, this is an interview with Phil Testerman. Um, Phil, um, I, I, I'm going to start out on and just asking you some basic questions. Where and when were you born? When and where? Yeah. <clears throat> I was born January 1st, or January 12th, 1927, in... Bates Township in Hand County, which is in the southeast part of the county. Okay. And uh, your, where was your family originally from? Were, were they pioneer settlers out here? My, my parents came from Comers Rock, Virginia, out here, and that would be in north, uh, would be in southwest Virginia. It would be close to Elk Creek or... Richmond was to the north of, but they were close to Tennessee and North Carolina, right in, right in the Blue Ridge Mountains. Okay, how long have they been there? Well, they'd born and raised there, and, right. and then they came out here in about 1920. Okay. Okay. And, and farmed out here in this country, but they, uh, there was a difference, a total different thing for them because they were used to hills and trees and running streams, and mm -hmm. they came out here to just flat land and and drought and carry water but carry it a long ways. Did they ever talk about what motivated them to move out to South Dakota? Well my uncle came out here in about 1905 okay. and he homesteaded in Bates Township and I guess that's what attracted he had my dad had two other brothers that came then went from here to Montana and homesteaded and then my dad was younger in the family and he came out in okay. about 1920 and so that's what motivated him to get out here. All right, all right. Did you have you had some brothers and sisters or brothers and sisters? There was nine of us kids. Nine, nine big in the family. family. Yeah, big family. I was about in the middle. Mm -hmm. I had an, I had uh, well, let's see. There's one, two, three, four, five of us boys and four girls. Mm -hmm. And there's let's see. My oldest brother is gone, and uh, I have a brother right below me that's gone, and a sister below me that's gone, and a brother below me that's gone. So there's okay. so there's five of us left. All right. Alright. What are your earliest memories on the farm? Yeah. <clears throat> well, we moved into Spring Lake Township, which was just the next township to one where I was born mm -hmm. in, uh, in 1928, and I was only a year old, so I don't remember moving over there, and my dad bought a farm there in 1928 in Spring Lake Township, and we moved there, and so my first recollections is in the 30s. Okay. And okay. they paid on the farm until 1933, and we had a terrible drought, and they lost mm -hmm. the farm. And they they paid on it three or four years or so, and then they lost it. So we okay. let, stayed there on that farm until 1939. All right. And then the federal government had housing or farm loans, mm -hmm. rural credit, or whatever yeah, they the want farmers, to call it. Yeah, uh, the farmers' home Yeah. Or farm security. Farm security. And they... So he signed up and we bought a farm back in Bates Township, which mm -hmm. is the kind, right? So we moved there in the 1st of March in 1939. Okay. Moved to the farm okay. down there. And uh, it was a funny thing. It was only four and a half miles from where I was in the seventh grade and we moved down there. And it was okay. only four and a half miles. I had never been on that farm in my life. It was only four and a half miles. So our world was fairly small. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, so you you lost the farm, but you didn't end up having one of the, have one of the farm auctions or anything. No, no, that, no. Like they was, were, they stayed they there, the and thing. they stayed there. And my dad worked on uh, WPA. Yeah. Helped build Rose Hill Dam in Rose Hill Township, just okay. township north of it, and helped gravel the Valand Road. I can remember that was they uh, they did it with teams and wagons mm -hmm. and. They got paid, I think, as I recall, that he got about eighteen dollars a month mm -hmm. for this work, and we lived on that, and that and got along yep. pretty good on eighteen dollars a month. And of course, I it was a funny thing when I was little. I thought everybody in the world was poor, mm -hmm. 
until I got older and I found out that about three or four percent of the people had all the money in this country. <laughs> Not much has changed. So. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, and so they, we moved to that place in, in 39 and mm -hmm. then we moved, and then Phyllis and I, when we got married, moved back to the place where I was uh, raised when I was one year old up to the seventh grade. Okay. We moved back on the place and we bought it back in about 1950. Okay. It's the place we had, you know, my folks had bought, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I bought it back. It it went to some insurance company, as I recall, and then a fellow in Seattle owned it, and I bought it from him. Okay. Okay. Um. It, do you have any memories of like the du dust storms in the oh, 1930s my. and some of the, some of those kind of oh, things? Oh, absolutely! Going on? I just uh, I can remember that as plainly as can be. We lived in this house that we had bought back then, but I can remember that like 10, 11 o'clock in the morning, the dust would be so bad. My mother'd have to light kerosene lights so you could see in the house, mm. and everything in the house would be dusty. You know, you'd have to window sills and everything else just dust everywhere and terrible dust storms. Mm -hmm. uh, Farmers, uh, <clears throat> I think the biggest thing is that we didn't understand soil conservation like we did later on. Yeah. We, uh, the government encouraged us in the th late 30s to, to get listers and list mm -hmm. ground to keep from blowing. And uh, we always had a tendency to work ground up and have it fine when the wind had blowed. But well, of course, we yeah. lacked water too. Mm -hmm. It wasn't nearly as bad as it was around Wolsey in that country where mm -hmm. they had sand. And that piled that up much worse than it did in our area. Although we had fences that got buried in dirt, and mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I can remember that. I can remember one spring, in I think it was 1938, 37, or 38. My dad had a disc, and we had an old regular farm all tractor, and he went out and was going to start to put plant crop in the spring, and that dust had blowed around that disc, and we had to take a spade and dig it out. It buried it with enough dirt that tractor couldn't pull that disc out. Mm -hmm. And so we had some piles of dirt in the country. It done a lot of damage to the topsoil in Hand County and Beetle County and every other county, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Did you get out and like plant some shelter belts, or was that? I did. That was a program that, well, that really got started in the thirties. When, when we uh, we didn't there because we moved from thirty nine and we moved down to an area in Bates Township where it was hillier and we had quite, there were quite a few trees on the place. Like I said, I had never seen the place in my life, and it had a big grove which right at the back of Ash Grove, mm -hmm. and we planted trees down there afterwards, you know, to yeah. shelter belts and whatnot, but not mm -hmm. like they did in the Wolsey area. But when we moved, Phyllis and I moved back up to our own farm, there was just two little rows of trees there, but we planted probably, oh, 10 or 15 acres of trees on that farm over the years. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. three row belts, two row belts, belt around the house, and, you know, shelter belt with 10, 12 rows in it. Mm -hmm. uh, and that helped. That cut the erosion down immensely when you know you had smaller fields and and yeah. they, we didn't farm like we did in the, in the yeah. 30s either. Yeah. Tried to you tried to use more chisels and stuff to keep from getting so it was so fine so it blew it away. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, what sort of a person was your dad? What do you remember? Uh, what do I remember about him? Uh, Dad was, uh, well, there's several of us kids, you know, but he yeah. he was born and raised in Virginia, and so he uh, it never bothered him to make things, you mm -hmm. know. If you had a pair of single trees and a horse, you know, he could take a piece of ash and take an axe, and he could do a lot of things with an axe that I never could do, you know. Mm -hmm. he, but he learned that as a kid in Virginia because they yeah. worked in trees all the time. And... Uh, Always insisted that we plant a lot of potatoes. I can remember that, you know, and this sort of thing, you know. To, and we picked them in the fall. And then yep. was, he was scared to death of a of a torn of a you know tornado or a bad thunderstorm. Mm -hmm. uh, when when I was about I suppose one year old, yep. or not quite a year, we lived there in Bates Town, in a place, and they had to come up a, a tornado, and they mother and and dad and we three or four little kids that were there at the time was that house that blew that house about a half a turn while they were in it. It was oh. a two-story house and they rode that out, blew the barn away and their hog house and whatnot on this place when a mm -hmm. tornado went through there. So he was always deathly scared of storms. And so when we moved down and 
this other place, the, the minute it, he'd see a cloud, we had to head to the cave. We we dug us first on the fourth of July in 1939. Yeah. We dug a cave and cemented it up, and we had a place to go in the storm. And when it got a bad cloud, we went to the basement, or not to the basement, to that outside cave, mm -hmm. and stayed in it until the storm was over. Yeah, because they were scared of a storm. They never had tornadoes like that in Virginia. They didn't have wind like we had here in Virginia, and so yeah. they weren't used to it at all. Yeah. Yeah, we're we're so, so used to when we just yeah kind of we we it, take but, it for uh, granted. I've people from other parts of the country who were put off by the amount of wind yes. here in the plains. Yeah. Yeah. How about your mom? My mom grew up about a quarter of a mile away from my dad. Uh, they were you know in that mm -hmm. particular area, Combs mm -hmm. Rock, Virginia, uh, and she was about four years younger than my dad mm -hmm. and he went back he came out here to south dakota and stayed a year or two and then went back yeah and then they uh, the neighbor gal and him got together and they went to bristol tennessee and got mm -hmm. married and came back to south dakota mm -hmm. and bristol tennessee and bristol virginia are two of the same the main street separates them that's where they were married was oh, in bristol okay. tennessee it's probably oh 50 60 miles from where they was born and raised and they brought they they rode train they always rode train you know going back and forth mm -hmm. at that time you could had good passenger service into Wessington or wherever yeah. Huron and whatever yeah. Yeah. But, so that was uh, I don't know I th I always wonder what my mom thought when she came out here and saw the bare ground when I was used to trees and mm -hmm. hills and oh, streams yeah. of water and yeah. exactly the opposite but yeah. she never long to go back except for a visit she always mm -hmm. see this okay. was home well, that's, a, that's a sign that she may have adjusted oh yes yeah. Yeah. yeah okay yeah when you were a kid did you always want to farm you ended up farming but did you have uh, any other aspirations uh i guess you you did but i had uh i had five brothers and sisters below me uh -huh. and uh, well, you were the oldest. Well, not at that. I wasn't the oldest in the family. Oh, no, yeah. they were, had three older than I was. Mm -hmm. But yeah. they is, okay. uh, when I lost a sister right below me when she was only a year old, and so yeah. then there was quite a space between the four. But I can remember when it, being in high school, when my folks were on the farm, and mm -hmm. I would uh, babysit the, those four, and I could yeah. feed them, change their diapers, and the whole thing. That didn't bother me at all. But because mm -hmm. mom needed a day off once in a while. Yeah. Yeah, and, uh, and I guess I never thought about that so much uh, about, but when I was like 19 years old, my dad had a heart attack. Mm -hmm. And so he couldn't work after that. He was like 49 years old, 50. Mm -hmm. And we had a thrashing rig. Yep. Uh, I, I went with him on the thrashing machine. I ran that for about six years. Mm -hmm. And I had... Uh, I thrashed, had a thrashing run. I can remember one year I started thrashing the 20th of August, mm -hmm. and I finished on Thanksgiving on uh, on uh, 30th of of, uh, of September. No, they, I finished on the, on uh, Halloween. Halloween, okay. So I, I'd done three runs that fall, and I never was so glad to shut off a machine in my life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> nah, and it went. It was hard for me, I guess, when I think about it that I was probably 19, 20 years old and I started doing that. And the crews that I had were like in their 40s or mm -hmm. uh, older gentlemen or, that worked there and some of them younger. I mean, had some young fellows, but had older people that were there and you had to yeah. tell them what you wanted them to do. And that was probably the most difficult thing is telling somebody 40 years old that you wanted to pitch bundles into a machine a certain way. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, and you had to keep track of the time and the bushels and all that stuff when you mm -hmm. were doing that. And, and you always had to go early, always had yep. to be there half an hour before anybody. And when they were taking a little noon siesta after lunch, I was back out greasing and getting ready for the afternoon. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. when I rest, they were working. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. They weren't using the big steam engines. No, no we had a neighbor. A that, I had a gas tractor. The first, first one I had was a... It was an F-20 International, I can remember mm -hmm. that, a 1939 F-20 is what I started with. Then I started, then I went to an M farm all when we finished the, mm -hmm. the, you know, four or five years later. Yeah, yeah. But my neighbor, right close to me, had a steamer. I mm -hmm. can remember the steamer running there, and you could hear that whistle three or four miles away yeah. when he'd blow the whistle, it's time to start. Mm-hmm, <laughs> mm-hmm.
Were there any uh, family type stories? You mentioned the uh, the, the uh, situation with the, the, your dad being afraid of storms. Were there any family type stories that got repeated a lot? And, uh, you know, kind of anything you want to talk about there. Well, yeah, there may be some stuff that you don't want to talk yeah, about. But, uh, I can't. I can't think of anything. The I'm trying uh, out these the, questions for the first time. The, uh, the I think the. The thing that I know is differently than now is that, you know, you had many, many more people lived in the country than mm -hmm. do today out sure. there, and so you had lots of neighborly functions mm -hmm. that you just mm -hmm. was a matter of going to, whether it was going to a farmer's union or if it was going mm -hmm. to church social, or and we raised, sure. we raised uh, ducks or geese or turkeys. We did different people raised different mm -hmm. things. So in the fall, they'd have a big butcher and bee, and then and they'd pick ducks and geese and dress turkeys, and then they'd take them to town and they'd ship them out. I don't know how they okay. kept them spoiling, but they iced them down and they got to town with them. But mm -hmm. they'd be several families get together and do that, and then when they got done, they'd usually have a big soup supper or something, you know, kind of celebrating their fall thing. That was one thing that I okay. remember. And then you had ladies' aid, where the yeah. ladies all got together. and. Mm -hmm. Uh, but you had a lot more community things mm -hmm. than you have today because your mode of transportation wasn't great. So yeah. uh, today, young people don't think nothing of talking to kids in two towns away. Mm -hmm. At that time, if you was five miles from home, you was a long ways. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. Uh, you mentioned Farmers Union. Did you, your folks belong to a Farmers Union local? Out here? Yeah, they was local. I can't remember what, what when it was at that time when we moved over to the other place and we went to the Farmers Union. Hilltop local, I can remember the name of it. was. Mm -hmm. It was a Girault County one, but it was held in Ham County. Okay. It was Hilltop local, and we met at Danforth's store. Okay. And there was a hall there. And, and I can, you know, the older people that were around there, and, you know, and kids came and everything else, and it had sizable, but there's there's not many people left out there anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, uh, but they always had a good time, you know, and you was, what the old song is saying, Solidarity Forever or something. Yeah. I remember some of the old songs that they used. Well, we had one lady who could play the piano, you know, and they always, mm -hmm. they was always uh, uh, interested in, I think, Probably true today. I mean, you're, you're more interested in what uh, rural folks and needs for rural people. You know, you, yeah. had to, you had to have one voice because you didn't, you couldn't have a big lobbying group because you didn't have any money to do it. Mm -hmm. So you had to lobby kind of individually. And mm -hmm. So I guess the old theory is there's strength in numbers. If enough of you got together, well, you'd listen. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, let's see. Hmm. Uh, did, did you ever have any guest speakers down there? Like, did Emo Lorix ever get out? Uh, no. To some of the places. No, it would have been more county there. We uh, didn't have time. Now, Emo I knew, but the, uh, no, we generally just have our own program. Sometimes mm -hmm. you'd have a state director come out talking about, it, say, youth, but not much for youth camps in either. They weren't started, I don't think, till a little later on. I mean, mm -hmm. not really. They'd have a county camp. Yeah. But not where they went to the Black Hills or anything mm -hmm. like that. It was more of a, the big corral was like a county camp or something if you had one. I never did attend one, but kids did. I know that. But, okay. Uh, but they, uh, okay. Where did you go to school at? I was went to country school. I there? went to country school. I, I went the first uh, seven years in Spring Lake, a little school called Prairie View School, mm -hmm. and then finished my seventh grade when from uh, March when we moved down to the other place I went to another school and that was the dump not that it was Posey school was the name of it mm -hmm. and I finished the seventh grade and the eighth grade down there and it was they were country schools and then went to Wessington to high school okay okay I think I'm going to ask you to stop doing that with the paper you know, yeah. you're yeah. making some extra noises here uh <laughs> Let's see if I can find my place here again. Okay, and um, did you did you finish school? Did you go on to high school? Yeah, I went to high school in Wessington. In Wessington. Yeah, and we had, at that time, you know, you didn't have bus service or anything mm -hmm. like that. And so I stayed in a dormitory and go in on Monday morning and come back home on Friday night. Mm -hmm. And then 
I went four years like that in high school, but it was amazing. We stayed, I stayed two years in the dorm and then a couple of years in private home. But we ate in a dorm. We ate in a school lunch program, breakfast, dinner, and supper. Mm-hmm. Uh, I can remember I paid a dollar a week for my meals and a dollar a week where I slept. So it was $2 a week was what I, it cost when I was in high school. And that was in... Uh, Oh, uh, I that was in forty, nineteen forty. Okay. I graduated in forty four. Mm-hmm. So things were starting to pick up again then, see, in, in the forties and so but you still you had NYA, National Youth Association. I did my older brother okay. worked that and a sister that worked in that. See they could get their meals free if they worked in that National Youth Association thing. Because oh, they okay. was three they was three of us in they was three of us in high school at one time. Mm-hmm. And then when I finished, I was in school alone. But they, but I think it cost me as much when I was a senior to be in school as it did all three of us when I started. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But prices started to go up a little bit then. And I carried water for a local barber shop that had a beauty parlor, and they liked soft water, and there was a cistern close there. And I can remember what I got. I got five cents a gallon. I liked Easter and Christmas because they'd done more hair then, so I got a mm-hmm. little more money those two weeks. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Um, you mentioned you graduated in 1944. Did you get drafted? I was, uh, I, no, I didn't. Some of the kids in my class were drafted before they got out of school. Okay, were they doing a lottery then to determine who got drafted no, you, and who didn't? No, no, you all got drafted. If, got yeah, drafted. you had to take your physical. But I was, yeah. I was the youngest person in my class. So I, when I graduated from high school, I was mm-hmm. 17 years old. Oh, okay. And so I didn't take mine until the next spring. Mm-hmm. That's when I went up to Fort Snelling, Minnesota for my physical. Yeah. But the other kids, they were kids in my class. She'll get that over here. She'll get that in the back room. Okay. And the other kids in my class, I had several in my class that were, the minute they got out of high school, had to go take their, their mm-hmm. physical. Mm-hmm. And when I took my physical in 45, the war in Germany was over and the one in Japan was practically over so you had to enlist if you wanted to get Mm -hmm. in the service Mm -hmm. and we had uh, I'm alone wanted to farm at home my dad not that well and so I didn't enlist there was Uh very few that did yeah yeah now, there were some folks that got caught again in the, when the Korean War started and ended up going to that. You know, yeah, see, my that. older brother right above me, he was in the service and went through Germany. Okay. And then when he got out, he could get out of the service he, uh, oh, a week or so early if he signed up in a reserve or something, which he didn't think the war was over. Mm-hmm. So he signed the reserve. So when the Korean War came, then they called him back. Mm-hmm. And he was married and had four kids. Wow. And so he was doing with his, he farmed close to me there, and so he was getting everything arranged, he's going to have to go. And then somehow the government said, no, he had too much responsibility there at home, so he didn't have to go. Mm-hmm. But he was he was an officer in the first, when he was in Germany, and so they called him back. And I don't know how he got it. He didn't ask to get out of it, they just let him out of it, you know, because he had yeah. four children when that came along. Yeah. But he was in that reserve, and he'd sign that little piece of paper, let him out of the service a few days early, mm-hmm. and it still recorded. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, did you go to college at all? I know you've been a strong supporter no. of uh, SDSU. No, didn't go to school. That was probably the one thing that I missed. I, mm-hmm. you know, did we, any of your brothers or sisters? Yes, I had... Uh, I have a sister that lives in Greensboro, North Carolina. She's graduated, a college graduate, and uh, then my younger brother just passed away. He had a couple of years of college, and then I got a sister that's a postmaster in St. Lawrence. Okay. She's got a little extra schooling. Mm-hmm. And then a sister right above me is a registered nurse. She went to Huron and then went to Rochester, Minnesota to finish her nurse's training. Okay, okay. Where did you meet uh, Phyllis at? Oh, talk about that a little that's, bit. That's that is kind of a long. You know, I tell you how kids at four or five miles away were quite a ways off at that time, and you didn't know too many students in the next town. Where today they know kids in every town around. Mm-hmm. She went to school in Wolsey. Okay. And then when she was about a freshman or a sophomore, I can't remember what she came to. Their folks moved over towards Wessington, and so she went to school in Wessington. So that's the first mm-hmm. time I ever saw her when she was about a sophomore in high school. 
and I thought she was a pretty good looking gal, a new strange gal, and I was a year ahead of her in school, and so we dated occasionally just to go to a little show or whatever, school function or whatever. Mm -hmm. And when she was a junior, shortly after this, they moved to Salem, Oregon. Her mm -hmm. folks did, and uh, war was going on then, and they moved out there. And her dad worked in a, he is a carpenter, and and her mother worked in a cannery mill or something. Her mother was a school teacher, but she mm -hmm. were they there was plenty of work available out there, and it paid better than here. And so they moved the yeah. whole family went out to Salem, Oregon. Mm -hmm. They had she had an uncle that lived out there, and mm -hmm. they went out there. So we wrote back and forth, you know, just mm -hmm. like kids will do. I think letters are five cents, it didn't cost you much to write. Mm -hmm. And so when I graduated out of high school, I was out of high school a year, and so I don't know why at a whim I was going to. So in December of that year, I drove out to Salem, Oregon, stayed out there for a little while with them. Mm -hmm. And her brother and her came back with me, and she worked in the hospital in Huron for a little while. Well, we decided that we that was too far away, so we decided we went to Rochester, Minnesota, and got married. Okay. Okay. <laughs> now, did her family stay out in Oregon? They came back about came back. after we okay. came back. They came back shortly after that and lived in the Wolsey area mm -hmm. then until they both passed mm -hmm. away. Okay. Yeah. There were, there were, I think, a lot of families from the, this part of the world who ended up in the Pacific Northwest. Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, Particularly those they had a they had a funny Oregon. scenario in Washington or Oregon or anywhere out there. Yeah. You'd go in and ask for a job, and they'd say where you're from. Well, you use from North Dakota or South Dakota or someplace like that. They'd hire you because they knew that you had good work ethics, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that's strange to me. But they did. They just knew that you had better work ethics than people from other areas. I don't. Know. I guess because we were poor and we knew that how to work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Heard that before. Uh, kids. Kids, I've got three boys. Three boys. Yeah, and three boys, and uh, they two of them live here in Miller, and one of them lives in. Their names? Uh, uh, James is the oldest, mm -hmm. and he's assistant superintendent of the highway department here. And then Kevin is my youngest, and he mm -hmm. lives here in town, and he's down here in the furniture store. It works in there with another fellow in there, and. Uh, Bruce lives in Denver, okay. and he's been in Denver for oh, 25, 30 years. Mm -hmm. and, and grandchildren? Yeah. And that was a funny thing. I've always told us, I said, you know, we was married, Phyllis and I were married for 35 years before I could buy a doll or a tea set. <laughs> because we had three boys, and we had four grandsons, uh -huh. and there was no daughters in that. Finally got a granddaughter so I could buy a doll. Okay. After 35 uh, years. Uh, 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 and I thought that, that would happens. Have, you know, yeah. The odds would be like 50 50. Yeah. But for so, some families, it goes one way or the other. Yeah. So we, well, we've got two, there was, uh, we had two, two granddaughters, and, but we had uh, six grandsons. Mm -hmm. And so that's eight, is eight. And now we had eight great grandchildren. Okay. And I think we're going to have another one here pretty soon. So oh, the right. great grands are going to pass the grands here pretty quick. Okay. Now, are any of them involved in farming? You mentioned the, the no. boys, and it sounds like none uh, of them. The youngest are. one farmed for a while on the farm there, and we yeah. done all kinds of things, and mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't big enough or something. I don't know what. But, yeah. uh, so they had a sale and got out of there. Mm -hmm. And the oldest one. He went to school in Springfield and worked in Valentine, Nebraska, when mm -hmm. he came back here. And the second boy went to Mitchell, to, when that was a brand new Votex school. We started to go to Springfield, and he wanted to take up some kind of automotive. Mm -hmm. So he went down to, and we went through Mitchell and looked at that, and he liked that. And so we, he went two years there and then moved to Denver and never came back. Mm -hmm. He has his own shop down there, and he does yeah. foreign cars. That's oh, all he okay. does is re redo a foreign car from bottom to top mm -hmm. and likes that. And the youngest one went to the uh, trade school in uh, Rapid City, or what was the Sturgis at that time, ag school there. Mm -hmm. And then he he went on to Denver and worked up in the Crested Butte area and whatnot for a few years. And I called him one day and I said, yeah, we were busy. If you get a chance, you might come back and help me a little. 
And so he loaded up and came home. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't know whether that was a smart move or not. <laughs> uh, how did you be first become, you mentioned uh, you built, your family belonged to a Farmers Union local down there. Uh, um, were your folks active? Members or just members, I would guess. Uh, okay, I was after older when we got the mm -hmm. one the hilltop when we yeah. were there. I think I was yeah. president of that for a little okay, while. Okay, so you were a okay, that was yeah. that your first involvement with that kind of thing, yeah, including cooperatives and so on. Well, the cooperatives at that time was I was served on a junior board in Weston and Springs at that okay. co op, and in that one, and uh, that was at a at uh in the Western Springs area, and mm -hmm. that was a, uh, they had, well, they had an elevator and, mm -hmm. and uh, station, yeah, 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 and then they'd done pretty well, in fact, they even had a grocery store and a cream yeah, station for a while, yeah, the yeah. big brick, well, I was involved in that, and not involved in it much, mm -hmm. but served on a junior board, advisory board, and then I served on a junior advisory board for re-electric mm -hmm. when they were up here, I'd done that for a little while. Okay. And was asked if I would finish out a term on the St. Lawrence Elevator Board, Kinetic mm -hmm. Cooperative over here, and I finished out that term and stayed with that for a few years. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, but you know, I could always, I, I've always had a saying, I still believe that today. You know, the reason you had cooperatives is because it was something that you could get done that you couldn't do by yourself. Mm -hmm. You had to have other people helping you. It's like we didn't, if it hadn't have been for REAs, we'd still be pumping water out there on the farm by hand. Mm -hmm. Because there wasn't any private power company going to put us in a line, I can tell you. In the same way with our phone system, we had Bell Telephone was fairly close to us. Yep. No way would they hook us up. We started our own phone system with RTA. Mm -hmm. And so we, that was so... Dale, you know, my life was co-op, I mean, because I, that what made it tick. Uh, same way with our fuel and what now we got from Westington Springs. I asked them, I can remember that so plain, you know, when we started the farm, I didn't have any money to speak yep. of it. So I went down to co-op and I said, you know, I don't have any money, but I wonder if I can charge some fuel in here like harvest. And they ticked me on mm -hmm. and I bought, never bought any place else for all the years I farmed because they were good to me when I started. And... Uh, there's a lot of things have happened to co-ops since then, but not all bad. I mean, they, like everything else, you change with the times. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, REA is still functional, and yeah. uh, there's no power company, uh, private power, ever want to take them over out there yet, I can tell you. And the same way with, well, right now, I, I got involved, I signed up on this rural water system mm -hmm. for out there. Uh, that was a plus for our country. You got a lot of farms that had poor water. Mm -hmm. and, that is a plus so we get river water in that country. Yep. yep. All over Huron, Miller. Mm -hmm. This water you got in Miller, you wasn't fit to drink, and we got good water now. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yep. And thanks for the co op. That's how that happened. Yep. I was kind of surprised to read recently that the private power companies actually back in the 40s resisted giving the rural electrics the right of eminent domain to put in power lines. Oh, yeah. They not only didn't want to do it themselves, they didn't want anybody else to do they it. They didn't want anybody. Yeah, I can. I remember a gentleman who lived right west of Wessington, and he was like a quarter of a mile from Northwest Public Service line. Mm -hmm. Asked him if he could get power, and they wouldn't give him power. The REA come through. They was going to give you power, and then they decided they wanted to give him power. And he said, no, it's too late. I asked you before, and you wouldn't give it to me. So he went to REA. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that was sad. They were that close and wouldn't give him power. Yeah. And since then, and I don't care if it's recorded or not, uh, th that was one of, the worst, one of the worst things that I've seen happen since I've been in this country, see Northwest Public Service file bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. And not for my sake. But for the sake of the people that worked all their life there and lost yeah. all their savings, yep. and they didn't get nothing out of it but a bad back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you mentioned you uh, you were first on a, a junior board at Wesleyan Springs. A lot of co-ops didn't have junior boards. No, they didn't. They did down there, and and I think they were smart. And so did this REA here had a mm -hmm. junior board. Yeah. And because then you got to know the functions. You didn't have any voting power, but you attended mm -hmm. meetings. You learned 
what made them function, what they had to spend money for, and what they had to do. And so you got an inside look at your qua. Mm -hmm. So you were better trained in when it come time for you to be a director where you kind of knew what was going on. Mm -hmm. And I think it was a plus for co-ops to have junior boards. I really do. It didn't cost them much. I don't think they paid us much. They mm-hmm. might have given us like 10 bucks a meeting or $5 or whatever mm-hmm. it was, but you learned how that co-op worked. Yeah. yeah. Now, Wesleyan Springs, that, that co-op was affiliated with Farmland yes. and with GTA. Yes. It's kind of an odd mix. Do yeah. you have any background on why they decided to go with Farmland instead of like a lot of the other ones did with what be, uh, with Cenex? Oh, Farmland was stronger in that end of the state without mm-hmm. any doubt. Yeah. yeah. And they kind of was a buffer zone that they came mm-hmm. up and hit, you know. But uh, farmland came, well, they wouldn't, when I first started doing it, I think it was CCA or something yeah. like Consumers Cooperative yes. Union or something. I forget yes. what it was. Then they changed their name to farmland. Mm-hmm. But they didn't have any grain facilities up here. Yeah. And so Weston Springs had an elevator, so they didn't. They couldn't ship the grain to farmland unless they put it on a car and sent it to the coast or something. They didn't. Mm-hmm. It was a. Mm-hmm. They could ship it to St. Paul, or yeah. so, and so that's the reason why they were they were all co-op minded. Yeah. Uh, but they, their tires and everything uh, came through their fuel and everything mm-hmm. came with that farmland thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, so there was a mix there. Yeah, there was a bit of a rivalry back yeah, Oh, there was yes. Later on, there was, was some cooperation. Yeah, but, uh, it took a long time, though. Yeah. You kind of had your own turf and you wanted to stand on it. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. It was sort of like, uh, well, even they plotted out territories mm-hmm. for like real electric or beetle electric or any of them. You had certain places that you served, you know, your mm-hmm. area was... And I think that the uh, co-op tried to do that to a sense they didn't... When, when people get more mobile like they are today, then you've got to take them boundaries down. Yeah. Because they don't yeah. work anymore. You still mm-hmm. see some mistakes they make. I mean, because yeah. but you never learn anything unless you made a mistake. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, hopefully you learn from the mistakes. Yeah, that's right. Sometimes people keep repeating the That's right. Uh, you, yeah, I always said if anybody didn't ever make a mistake, they really have never done anything. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> now, the, I, I would guess that the issues that were facing the local cooperatives back in those days are quite different than face them today. Yeah. I think you were so. We're still in the growth mode. Yes. Uh, but, but small, really, if you look you at, had, the, uh, at the dividends and so on and the, the net. The, the thing that I see is that at one time, you know, uh, the not the grain, but the Farmers Union was very instrumental in the Cynics, the mm-hmm. uh, Farmers Union GTA, yeah. and those up there, they were very instrumental in that. Where you got further south and you would see more grangers and that sort of thing. It was always, you had to have some kind of farm organization to get people mobilized to really believe in them somehow. Mm-hmm. I don't know why. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it was a it was a strange mix. Yeah. And yeah. they got involved in different things. Uh, well, Farmers Union got involved in insurance mm-hmm. and. Uh, I sold at Farmers Union Insurance for several years. Okay. Were you still doing that when I started in the early 70s? Yeah, I could probably had a license, but probably yeah. wasn't real active in it yeah. then. But yeah. I kept my license for a while in case I wanted to go back. I enjoyed that. You got to meet a lot of very interesting people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Was that business a little different in those days? My dad sold a little insurance on the farm in North Dakota, and it seemed like they were... Uh, the, the, like all of the agents kind of had, well, these are your people and these are mine, and yeah. we don't compete real heavily yeah. with each other. Well, you 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 wrote out of your local, yeah. So your people in that local were your property, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And so you'd have a new thing come in, like with farm liability or something. You'd present it to the local, and maybe you could sign up ten or twelve of them at one time, you know. And then, mm-hmm. and they always had a restriction that you had to be a member, you know. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. I. I we still pay membership and mm-hmm. we're not on the farm, but that doesn't make any difference. It still was a cause that you believed in. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Did you uh, get a chance to meet or work with any interesting people back in those days? Or any p- particular folks that you remember uh, uh, at the local level? Oh, people? Yeah. Well, you had a lot of them that you were really interested in, you know, that you really, uh, uh, I can remember the head of our local down there was Ross Cotton that lived south of town here. Mm-hmm. 
he was he was pretty dynamic speaker, you know. Yep. And I headed up the local, and that was years ago. Uh, of course, uh, Ben was Ben Radcliffe was said you know knew him a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, so you you run into people like that. Uh, your co-op leaders nationally. I can remember the first time that I ever uh, from uh, harvest or from. Farmers Union GTA was. I remember meeting Mr. Thatcher. Yeah, he was quite a dynamic uh, you know, speaker. I understand. Oh yes, yeah. so he he could t just get up and off the cuff could give you half an hour. You know, mm -hmm. if you had to. Mm -hmm. And he built that thing. There was no yeah. doubt about it. Yeah. He. I didn't always agree in some of the things he'd done, but the, you shouldn't agree with everybody. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. uh, but I can remember meeting him. Uh, I. Probably more interesting people after I got involved in in different things yeah. than to start with. I mean, you met the local managers, mm -hmm. and we had a local manager in area, Bob Moore, that I thought the world yeah. of. He came from North Dakota down here. Mm -hmm. I don't think all the people, but he done. He, he was a great organizer. He done he done yeah. a lot of things for this rural electric here. Mm -hmm. uh, the local people when we got our telephone, I can remember a local neighbor coming and selling me a share in the RTA. Mm -hmm. And it was like it was, we didn't have a phone, and I thought, well, this is unusual. You signed up, and by golly, it was in a few years we got a phone. Then, okay. so what kind of phone did you get first? Did you get a wall phone, or did you get a no, dial, we, uh, black we, dial? We had a we had a we had a just a dial phone, but okay. what we had party line yet when we mm -hmm. got it. So mm -hmm. you had about seven or eight people on the same line. Okay. Did they ever listen in? Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, your worst thing, if you really wanted to use the phone and somebody was visiting on us, it wasn't rude at all. You'd call and say, I, well, I'd, I'd like to use the phone for a minute. It's important. And they'd hang up and let you use it. Okay. Generally speaking. Okay. And then they could call each other back and talk after you got done. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So you'd wait a little bit. And if they kept talking, you'd, you'd just butt in and say, because you could hear everything that was going on. Would you just... If you had to have a part or you just mm -hmm. broke down or something, why well, they understood that and they'd hang up and let you use the phone and they could get back and talk to each other. Yeah, yeah. Are there any party lines out here anymore? <laughs> I don't they, think so. I don't think so. I think no. they're all they're pretty all well private. Yeah. 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 Uh, did, did you mentioned you served on the the junior board at Wesleyan Springs and you were you on the on the Rural Electric Board for a while? I was junior member on the Rural Electric Rural, Board, too. Okay, okay. And, uh, uh, and when do you, you think about maybe running for the, uh, for, the, for the GTA board? Well, after I'd been on the elevator board in St. Lawrence. In yeah. fact, I was on there for a few years. Okay. And I was chairman. So it was from that elevator board yes, in St. Lawrence. Yes, I was on yeah. the I was chairman of the board there, and uh, I remember the gentleman, he used to manage the elevator there. It's dead now, but mm -hmm. he was a district person in the West End for the feed division, Jack Fanning. His, his wife still yeah. still lived there, uh, still lives in St. Lawrence. But he encouraged me to run for it. I guess I hadn't thought about it doing okay. it. And yeah. so then I had a, another beats, fellow that uh, encouraged me too was Leroy Wheedle from Frederick, mm -hmm. South Dakota. Mm -hmm. He was uh, vice president of the Farmers Union. He encouraged yeah. me to run. And then we had a uh, Jargonson down at Winter that encouraged me to run. So that's why I ran. And mm -hmm. I didn't win the first time. Oh, you didn't? What uh, year was that? That was, oh boy. There's a bunch of dates in that okay. thing there that it rolled up for your Hall of Fame thing. Okay. I, I must have ran in about 68 or 69. Okay. And I ran against Norman Olson. Okay. And Norman was, and him and I were running to take Emil Lorix's place on the board. All right. And so I knew Emil, I went and seen him, mm -hmm. and Norman was very instrumental in Farmers Union and served as vice chair in the Farmers Union, I believe, and good friend of mine, Canton, mm -hmm. South Dakota. And Did we ran. to serve for quite a while. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so. He he took Emil Lorick's place. Yeah. And so so it must have been maybe before that. It had to be a little earlier because I ran against Norman the next time he came up too and got beat. Okay, so you ran <laughs> twice. Yeah. So the third time I ran was August Domney mm -hmm. was retiring off the board. Yeah. And I ran in that New next August year, and so that that then I won. In fact, I think I got 
Well, when you look a little later here, I can show you some pictures of August when he's pinning my little thing on me. Okay. To city. Uh -huh. He was he was uh, August. I like August, August and Amel had served on there a long time. They uh, Amel had been on there to the start of the board. Oh yeah. In fact, I was uh, I can remember I was the fourth person that was ever elected to the to the GTA board from South Dakota. Okay. And uh, Norman was number three, and I was number four. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> from the time it started. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I didn't get to serve under Mr. Lorix, so I don't know. I mean uh, Thatcher. Yeah. He was gone, so yeah, Barney yeah. Molesky was mm -hmm. the CEO when I started. Okay. You want to talk about Barney a little bit? Because I remember Barney, Barney, too. Barney was, you know, uh, I guess I always, you know, you, you stop and think about it. Your CEO sits on the, when we was the old building out on Snelling and Larpenter, mm -hmm. he was on the top floor and the fourth yeah. floor. And he and I were good friends. I mean, to, I, I love to sit down and visit with him a little bit because, but that's a lonely place, let me tell you. I mean, yeah. you get paid pretty well for what you're doing, but it's a lonely place because the buck stops there. Mm -hmm. uh, he sat there and he depended on his people and the divisions to answer to him, and they mm -hmm. better give him good information because it was wrong that he was to blame. Yeah. Uh, and so. I, he tapped his fingers enough on the desk that they were calloused. Like <laughs> <laughs> but he was, he was, I think he was real fair with these people. Mm -hmm. I really, I think he was real fair with these people. He, uh, he thought things out, and and I think they had a lot of respect for him. Yeah. I know when he got to be, there was probably some other people that would like to be, and then there's Lowell Hargens from yep. Montana. What we called him, Silent Sam. He was next in charge there, and he was doing a lot of the things for Barney, too, kind of quietly on the side. Mm -hmm. So he was his right-hand man, and I liked Lowell, too. I liked them both. Mm -hmm. they, didn't, they were good people to work with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In fact, I don't, I don't have any bad feelings about anybody that I worked with in, okay. in, that, in that company. I really don't. Okay. I had some very good friends in there. Yeah. Any other board members that you remember that you worked with from other states? Uh, well. Which ones did you work with from South Dakota here? You worked with Norman. Norman. With Norman. I had I had Norman. Then I had Ray Newhauser Ray came Newhauser, on, and he yeah. come a couple terms, and then uh, Tyrone Moose yeah. from Philip came All on from out west. Yeah. yeah, and so those are the two other ones that I worked with, other than mm -hmm. Norman. Norman was fun to work with. Norman was a a great historian. Yeah, he was a great historian. You could, he he evidently done tours or ran tours for Farmers Union in Washington D.C. Oh at yeah, that those time. ones in the fifties. Yeah. Yes. And yes. so you could go to Washington, D.C. with Norman. We went mm -hmm. once a year to see Congress okay. when we was there. And he was a fun guy to be with because he knew where everything was at. Mm -hmm. He knew what things to go to that were interesting. Yeah, yeah. Do you think today the, uh, the, the, the regionals perhaps don't participate as much in farm policy development as they used to? It seemed like Thatcher was almost... Uh. Uh, a, a, sh a, a real shaper of the farm bills, yeah. whereas uh, it seems like the regionals today kind of stand back and look at particular smaller issues that relate to the cooperative, but not the uh, overall farm thing. I think, uh, yeah, I have to agree with you. Even though they adopt resolutions on they, it, they don't uh, seem to work a lot. They're more consolidated now. They have more people to talk to, but I don't think uh, we went once a year. Every, yeah. and, and talk to not just our congressmen mm -hmm. or senators. We we just had a list of people we went and talked to mm -hmm. when we were there. And yeah. some of them you got a pretty good reception, some you didn't. And uh, you never felt negative about it because you knew they was busy doing other things. But you went yeah. to see them to let them know that you was interested in some things that would help farm people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think about the wheat referendums, for example. Yes. Uh, the, the, uh, you know, Thatcher was just a yeah. well, he was strong supporter of the wheat program. Thatcher always had a saying, you know, the prices are made in Washington. He was down there to see if they was made right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he always said that. Prices are made in Washington. And he didn't he didn't have any bones about it. He had, Hubert Humphrey was one of his favorites, you know, to have come and speak at the annual convention. Mm -hmm. And Hubert always accommodated him. You know, uh, we had, uh, I sat with... Uh, Oh, he ran for president from Kansas. Yeah. Crippled hand. What, uh, why can't I say his name? Got to, oh, Bob Dole. Bob Dole. Yeah. Had lunch with him one day up there. He came there. And I was impressed with him. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a secretary of agriculture that came block, I think, or something from Illinois or something mm -hmm. that I was not impressed with. 
No, no, he might have been a nice guy, but I just it didn't impress me at all. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know why, but I just I could never get, yeah. uh, I couldn't get connected with him at all. What I had some, oh, well, Jim Abner from South Dakota served in the house yeah. out there. Jim was, I got, you know, in different parties, but him and I could relate and talk to, I enjoyed visiting with Jim. Mm-hmm. Uh, we had Larry Pressler, and Larry's biggest concern, I think, when I, when, whenever we came there or anybody else, is the first thing you want to do is have a picture of you so you could put it in your local paper to say that you'd been there. I didn't come there to get my picture taken. I came, I told him that one time, I came mm-hmm. to talk about some farm issues. Yep. I didn't need my picture in the paper. Mm-hmm. I think it startled him a little bit, but I really felt that way. I don't have to stand and pose for a picture. That don't do nothing for farm people. Yep. Yeah. And of course, Tim Johnson mm-hmm. served with him in the state legislature. Yeah. Dashell I knew for years. That was one of the biggest mistakes, and I hope this is recorded, that is. South Dakota ever made is when they let him go. You get leadership in the Senate, you've got to have your head examined. I don't care mm-hmm. what part of there is, you let them go. Because mm-hmm. the, what they do, the perks that come off of them, oh, you yeah. can't write about it or even think yeah. about it. Yeah, you think about the rural water projects now and think <sighs> wonder whether we're going to be able to have as much muscle for those. Or I see Ellsworth is on the tentative yeah. closing list. But they, with leadership, I don't care what yeah. party it's in. If it's, you, I'll never live long enough to see us ever have another leader in the U.S. Senate from South Dakota. I can tell you that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so we made a horrible mistake in this state, and I, I, I just hate it because someday they're going to know it. Yeah. yeah maybe sooner than later. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you were on the uh, on the GTA board at the same time of the merger with North Pacific Grain Growers. Yes. Uh, uh, and and uh, and. The merger resulted in Harvest States cooperatives. Yeah. Would you like to talk about that merger experience? You know, I'd that was you know we that was a little. We didn't have an export house off the West Coast. We mm-hmm. didn't have a place we could really ship off the West Coast, and it looked like a smaller cooperative that had Kalama, Washington, had an export house there. Mm-hmm. The Union Pacific goes in there, and Burlington Northern goes into that yard, and. They were having, the, they handled only probably basically one product, white wheat. Yeah. Uh, some, a few other things, but that was mm-hmm. their basic commodity, was white wheat, and they had an office in Portland. Mm-hmm. And so we had visited with them, and we didn't have any connections, a little connection, but we had to use them to get, we needed to get to where we could be with them, if we could, talk to them. And I think they was having probably a little financial trouble right at that time, not a whole lot, but they were having mm-hmm. some, whether they liked to believe it or not. And so they were eager to talk to us. Yeah. And of course, they spelled some things that they wanted. They wanted. They wanted. They didn't want to lose their name. And they thought if they did, we should lose ours. You go through all that scenario. Mm-hmm. That's the little stuff. Big thing yeah. is that you got a connection to get in there. Uh, they had several board members, and they agreed to drop down to two mm-hmm. on the board if they. Because uh, we always had tried to go by volumes, you oh, know. Yeah. Yeah, they, North Dakota always had four. Mm-hmm. South Dakota had two. Yeah. So we had to change our areas a little bit. Montana at one time had three, I think mm-hmm. it was on there, and they went down to two. And so we changed some of those things to accommodate mm-hmm. them. And I was always a firm believer, not a great big board. Mm-hmm. The bigger the board, the longer it takes to make a decision is all mm-hmm. it amounts to. And we mm-hmm. went up to 15 for a while, and I was anxious to get down to, like to have got down to 11. Yeah. Because I think that you're more functional then, regardless mm-hmm. of who was in it. But that was a, we worked a long time. We had a funny experience with that one. They had, without us knowing it when we were getting together, they had had a a boat that caught on fire at their dock, and I think a mm-hmm. person got killed on it. I, I think I got a couple pictures of the old boat that was burned up. And our dock man there at Kalama, we wasn't involved in it. It was tied there, and instead of letting it sit there, they cut them loose and let it just go out in the harbor to burn, and which is they should have had it there so they could put the fire out. Yeah. And so they had a big lawsuit of like $20 million hanging overhead, and we didn't know it. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. our attorney found that, and so we spelled out that they were hung out to dry for that lawsuit, not yeah. us, if we got yeah. together. So it was a long series. It didn't happen overnight. It took a couple of years. Mm-hmm. And so we finally got together and I think it was positive after we got going. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we made a lot of trips, but we had an export house where you could sell white wheat, red wheat, 
uh, corn to Japan, and mm -hmm. it's freight's funny. You know, it really is because sometimes you can ship wheat and corn off of the New Orleans coast or New, at New Orleans cheaper to Japan than you can off the West Coast. And you go mm -hmm. through the it depends on what you, you buy ocean freight or it's bid, you know. So you can, right now, mm -hmm. I think you can go off the West Coast cheaper. But we had a time when all of it went out of New Orleans mm -hmm. and cheaper than it would off the West Coast. Yeah. Strange. Yeah. Mm hmm. What do you think was the, the, the problem? Uh, it seemed like over the years it's been difficult for the regional cooperatives to, to really get the kind of foothold dealing with the, the large uh, private grain companies. or Size. Yeah. I think yeah. size is the biggest yeah. thing. Uh, you start bucking ADMs and those kinds of people and uh, they, they play hardball if they want yeah. to and, and very definitely so. They... Mm -hmm. Uh, I was always interested in us to have a select market, you know. We, yeah. were, we were noted for some things, you know, very selective. You know, you had upper Midwest, very good wheat, you know, some of the best in the country. Yeah. Malting barley out of North Dakota. Mm -hmm. uh, if you got a corner on that, well, you can sell that. You don't have to worry about the ADS. But when it comes to foreign selling and the kind of capital it takes, uh, you had some of them that's, that's just pretty tough to... I was trying to think of the one person that was one of those big regionals on the side there that used to work for Harvest States. Or, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Andreas? Yes. Andreas. Yeah, they, yes. They, run, they run part of the uh, a soybean processing plant. They worked for mm -hmm. Harvest States and they let yeah. them go and, and created a, you know, a heck of a monopoly on working. And they get their foot in the trough once in a while wrong, too. Mm -hmm. uh, Mm -hmm. We had we had Dwayne and his boy come up and speak to us our board one time because he yeah. used to be our employed with us. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting to listen to their philosophy. He was telling us that he could go over to Russia and talk to the Russian people easier than the Department of Ag, U.S. Department of Ag. And I believe him. Yeah. He, had, he had a better audience with him than the U.S. Department did out there. Mm -hmm. uh, but it depends on how much money you throw in places that makes things happen sometimes. And we did... Don't play with the big boys. You don't have the cash. I can tell you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But you, you could still make your voice heard. But. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, what was your most positive experience? Was that it, or on the on the during the years you served on the GTA board? What were the years like? I served twenty twenty one years on it, yeah. seven terms, mm -hmm. and. I served, it started, I ran, that was the, probably the thing that, I ran for the legislature and I had that for a while. I was in the legislature and I was on the GTA board. Mm -hmm. uh, and I had to finally make up my mind which one I preferred. Mm -hmm. Because in winter when the session was on, that's your busy time in harvest states or GTA yeah. too. Yeah. So I caught myself be in one place they should be someplace else and I mm -hmm. said I got to make up my mind if I want to be in politics or if I want to be on that board and I thought that I could be more of a uh, good to people by being on that board than I could be in, in politics so I quit the Senate mm -hmm. I, I stopped I didn't run and I said I want to devote more time to that mm -hmm. uh, I think what I liked it the best was uh, going to annual meetings, yeah. speaking to people, seeing what their concerns are. Mm -hmm. uh, you have some ups and downs. You have some things that they do real good, and then and they won't. And you have to make some hard choices once in a while. But uh, still, you think about the people it affects, and I think that's the main thing. We one experience we had: we bought some feed plants in Nebraska, went down there with John Johnson, which is the head of it now, mm -hmm. and talked and worked with some of those people, and we bought a few places down there, and they they could not understand how we could come in and put on a free lunch when you're having an open house. They didn't know what that was. They didn't mm -hmm. understand that you put brats and potato chips and beans and coffee and Kool-Aid out because you're having an open house. <laughs> and so that was real strange to me. Yeah. You know, because yeah. they weren't used to that because there's lots of little feed plants in Nebraska and they all compete for a little certain amount of business. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I said, we don't want part of it, we want most of it. That was yeah. all we wanted. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there was... 
I enjoyed going to Washington, and and when mm-hmm. we got together with uh, like the Speaker of the House from Washington State, he got mm-hmm. beat, and he Foley come and talked to us one time, and he really impressed me. I mean, he was down to earth sort of person. Yeah, yeah. Uh, those kinds of things you remember. You know, you just think about the things like that that mean a lot to you. Yeah. Uh, Uh, and you may have already touched on this, but uh, uh, the decision-making process on the board in those days, uh, uh, you mentioned uh, the size of the board makes a difference for that. Yeah, I, th- I think that uh, the decisions we made usually... I don't think we had many split decisions. You might have disagreements, but before we leave the board, we always had our disagreements ironed out. Mm-hmm. And try, we, when we made a decision, we liked to be unanimous. Even though you didn't, we, you wasn't you was ninety five percent sure, yeah. but you wasn't hundred. But you didn't want to walk out being a dissenter. Mm-hmm. Uh, we tried to work it out so that everybody was agreeable of what we was going to do, and it yeah. was some of them was some people would be more knowledgeable than others. Mm-hmm. I can remember one time that I was, they was going to start a new feed plant in North Dakota for livestock, mm-hmm. and I just had a fit about that because they had a couple of feed plants in North Dakota. We only had one in Sioux Falls. Yeah. And I drug out all the old statistics I could find that, that South Dakota had twice as many cattle, yeah. twice as many hogs, twice as many sheep. Mm-hmm. I said, you know, we only got one feed plant. We need one in West River, like Pier, somewhere out there mm-hmm. to serve this area. And we finally compromised. They got their new feed plant in North Dakota, but the next one that was going to be bought or fixed was going to be in South Dakota. Mm-hmm. And I, I can remember being the Lone Ranger on that, and we did. We bought the one in Gettysburg then, and, to, and they worked out of that plant. And we tried to buy the one in Rapid City, Hubbard's or whatever it was, yeah. you know. Because I said we're we got a lot of vacuum in the southwest part of the state or west part of the state that we're not covered like we ought to. Bell Fouche mm-hmm. got theirs out of North Dakota, yeah. But it was South Dakota. Their volume was coming a lot of it from South Dakota. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, did you think maybe that was just the muscle of more board members from North Dakota? No, I think location more than anything. Yeah. Location, location, and not the location of the cattle, but because it was on the interstate. Oh, okay. And because he's on Burlington Northern. Yeah. And South Dakota right. does not have it doesn't have east to west coast rail traffic. No, still don't. No, it never North has. Dakota. Yeah. See, yeah. we always did. We're hopeful. We had uh, we had the Black Hills were gifts to the Indian people, so there never was a railroad went from east to west coast through South Dakota. Nebraska had yeah. Union Pacific, North mm-hmm. Dakota had Burlington Northern, and mm-hmm. um, that was just a natural thing. But South Dakota didn't. They went to the Black Hills, and you had branch lines that mm-hmm. hooked up with them, but nothing, yeah. no no yeah. coast to coast railroad. Yeah. Yep. And that well, had, had that Milwaukee Road going across the north part of the state, but they were never uh, competitive yeah. compared to, to yeah. BN or... Yeah. Uh, see, they Pacific. still hook up the old rail over here to Wolsey, goes up through Aberdeen and hooks up into Montana on BN. Mm-hmm. But uh, what we have here goes from Rapid City to Minnesota. Yeah. If you're shipping grain east, we probably got it, but they, they have an advantage Mm-hmm. When they go north and west, you get a better freight rate. So that hurts the railroad going east and west here. Yeah, yeah. You think the DM and E, if that could, I love project to. would finally get done. That that would be a, certainly a benefit for. It'll this benefit state. this state more than they could even realize if we just get over the f- feeling that they got to have intimate domain and all that. Yeah. Uh, when it starts, the coal trains. Go down to North Platte, Nebraska. They have coal trains go through there all the time. Don't bother them people. And mm-hmm. it goes right through town. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of those towns, you got to either elevate and go over, or you're, and that's the simplest thing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, they don't make any. They don't make as much noise as one going through slow. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I understand the turnaround time for for grain shipments would be a lot better. Oh my yes. If you didn't, uh, you know, you could that, probably. Uh, I'll walk the train sometimes yeah. around here. Well, yeah, this one here is more speedy now than it used to be. Yeah. But if they re- if they get this thing to the coal field, it will get upgraded again. It'll be heavier rail. It'll be mm-hmm. speedier. Yeah. Uh, Hundred car-, car trains will go, and they'll the turnaround time, and that counts. I mean, you mm-hmm. can you can't get so many turnarounds while you're going to lose. You're going to have to charge more freight. That's just that simple. Mm-hmm. 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 
And I think it'll help our roads. You take some semis off the roads if you can go unit trains. That saves trucks on the road. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, looking at the situation today, you know, we're, we, there are challenges facing organizations and cooperatives. Uh, uh, what do you think is the biggest change that we've experienced from when you were first involved with co-ops until today? I think they reach out further. They're not as close-knit as they were because there's less people. I mean, I mm-hmm. just... Uh, uh, just an example, uh, Real Electric here joined Beetle Electric for a simple reason. It's, yeah. You have one person, can be the head of it, and less directors. Uh, you still serve those people, but you don't serve as many. But the ones they do serve are probably bigger customers. Mm-hmm. They have bigger feedlots, they have bigger yeah. farming operations. Uh, they're spread thinner, so to speak. I mean, you don't have the, uh, you still serve the area, but you don't serve the amount of people we used to. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's the thing, and so then you start to see consolidation, which is, well, we see it. Cynics and and Harvest States got together. Mm-hmm. Simple. Uh, I spoke against them going together with farmland, yeah. and I really felt pretty serious about it because I, I said, you know, you can. It's a terrible thing to think, but I said you can work with people and you can sleep with people, but if you marry them, my friend, it's for better or worse. <laughs> and then that was what I couldn't see because I went down and toured some of farmlands and I've seen some bad chemical spills and things that if you get together with people like that, you're as liable for that as they are then. Yeah. And they and since then, farmland went bankrupt. Mm-hmm. There was some resentment, uh, I, I think, among some of the co-op people that the Farmers Union got involved in, in opposing that merger. But I think maybe afterwards when they saw what happened to farmland, and perhaps farmland wasn't giving them all the information about their finances, that maybe they, maybe they changed their mind on that. Well, if they didn't, they should have. You know. I, uh, I'd done business with farmland all my life on the farm. Yeah. And I can remember what really struck me that one year that they had a bad year too. They took thirty some percent of my earnings mm-hmm. and everybody else's to pay off their debt that yeah. they had. And I asked when they had the regional meeting here. I said, "Now what happens to the rest of my earnings?" I said, "Are you going to take those two? And they did. Yeah. Uh, I said, "You know that's what scares me." I said, "If you get together, are you going to pick up that thirty some percent you take away from me, or is it gone?" I said, my biggest fear is that you're going to wipe out earnings I got in Cynics and Harvest States and yours too. Because you, if they had taken on the load they had, I don't think that I don't think Cynics and Harvest States could have weathered the storm. I honestly mm-hmm. don't. I think they'd have went broke too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And my fear was slow down a little. Yeah. Don't, did, you know. did you think that maybe, what did you think about the executives and the, the attitudes they seemed to have? It seemed like they had like almost like whether in the co in the corporate world are known as golden parachutes out of Well, there was some golden parachutes there that shouldn't have been, should have been dropped mm-hmm. because uh, you don't, I, I can see rewarding people if you work hard, but I don't see rewarding losses. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Their compensation to get out of that was going to be fairly heavy. Yeah. I think they still done all right. They didn't get as much as they should have, I mean, or they wanted, mm-hmm. but I think they got more than they deserved. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because they weren't, you know, our CEO when I was on there, you know, we, we, I thought the people said, well, they could go someplace else. I said, let them go. Yeah. You give somebody six, seven, eight hundred thousand dollars for an annual salary plus a bonus, you can find people that will jump in there and take that job, I can tell mm-hmm. you. Yeah. But you can get the dishwasher or the floor sweeper at eight dollars an hour. They're probably lined up to get that job too, but I'll tell you, if you're paying high enough wages, you can find CEOs. Look at the CEOs today, how many of them are corrupt after they get too high. Mm-hmm. And they, mm-hmm. uh, rich people don't go to jail, poor people go to jail. Yeah, and it seemed like they were involved with somehow with a, uh, a some sort of a Wall Street firm that, yes. uh, that, that w- made a business of kind of putting two groups together yes. for mergers. And like, would, like they had an issue to do that, regardless of whether it was a good idea yeah. for the two groups. Now the uh, I I was I was so glad that that didn't function and go through because I mm-hmm. just I just felt really strongly that it was it was I didn't do it for my own good. I just did because I was concerned about the co-op that we we're going to lose it. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, yep. You can't help it. Sometimes you see a business go broke, but don't do it intentionally. Mm-hmm. 
today it looks like we have a pretty strong yes. regional system as a yeah. result of maybe making the, 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 the producers in the country, in that instance, making the right decision. That's right. Uh, in the local co-ops. Uh, the, yeah, you, you see that now, that the... It, all the little co-ops are not going to function. They're going to some go broke. I mean, they're, they're mm -hmm. going to quit. I mean, I can just see some right over here in the north, north of us, and Hoven and some of them, you know, that, that are not Hoven, but Roscoe or somewhere up in there, they're going yeah. to have to change, you know. The people aren't there, so they lose the business, so you got to consolidate or do mm -hmm. something. Yep. Uh, we had Miranda right north of us here, strong co-op. Isn't mm -hmm. today. It's part of St. Lawrence. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So you got to, sometimes you make a mistake doing some of those, but it isn't as big a mistake as if you don't do nothing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do you think we're doing enough in the area of cooperative education today? I know we have a strong camp system in Farmers Union, but do you think there's, there's enough? Uh, because it seems like it's difficult to get the kind of co-op loyalty from the the younger producers that are out there that perhaps existed when you were uh, first involved? They uh, <clears throat> they looked to different sources of finance than we did when I was growing up. You know, you used you used your co-op a lot, you know, for financing uh, to a certain degree. I mean, mm -hmm. you, you went in and you charged the chicken feed and the hog feed and all that for a month and you paid it then and whatever. But now, you when they, the bigger operators today, they don't buy a bag of seed corn, they buy a pallet. Mm -hmm. So they don't, they bypass that local and they go to the source and yeah. and they're buying that stuff. Uh, uh, I I don't think, I don't think there's caught mining unless they got the power shut off or something like that. Then I think they'd see some difference. I, yeah. I worry, my biggest worry today is like with REAs and whatnot, uh, to be sure that they have enough power. Mm -hmm. To run these farms, you know, yep. uh, we we see that in town here. You know, the the WAPA, mm -hmm. the juice that was coming here is not enough anymore, and so yeah. you're going out to look for some more. Mm -hmm. uh, hopefully, that we have enough coal stations yeah. and enough windmills turning mm -hmm. to take care of when we get low river water. I mean, to take care of these people because they why well, I can here on the yeah. farm. We could hardly bear, burn the minimum when we first started. That was 30-some kilowatt hours. Yeah. We burnt that every day before I left, twice that mm -hmm. much a day. Yeah, people didn't put in as many electric outlets as they, they yeah. found out they were going to need later on. No, you had four in the whole house, you need 30. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, and you yeah. weren't wired for it either. Yeah, but it was such a change to be able to go out to a barn and turn a light on. Mm -hmm. uh, still used wind for water and all that yeah. stuff, but if we increased and got bathrooms and got electric stoves and all that, I remember when we got our first refrigerator, we had an old kerosene refrigerator. Mm -hmm. We got electric and we had to wait till the REA come on before we could use it, and that was a plus. You had an ice cube when you wanted it. Yeah. But yeah. There wasn't, we still had the old gas stove, wood stove. Mm -hmm. Well, I remember getting a refrigerator for the first yes. time on our farm. Yes, you bet. I yeah. remember my sister being really disappointed when we went to the appliance store because she was small and she looked and there wasn't any food in it like there was in the magazines. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we, yeah we, that, was, that was something to have a refrigerator. Yeah, yeah. And we, for a lot of families, it was a, uh, the question was whether to get the stove or the refrigerator that's, first. That's right. Yeah, they yeah. were very limited in your amount of money you could spend for things. That's mm -hmm. that's the reason why you never had a high electric bill to start with, too. Yeah. And a lot of the cooperatives sold uh, oh, yes. co-op freezers and co-op... Uh, we had two co-op freezers. Yeah. We had a co-op, yeah, we got them from Weston Springs. They sold appliances. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. You didn't even think about it. You just went and got a deep freeze, so you got a 15-footer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, well, about that time, I think Farmers Union was sponsoring some kind of big co-op rallies, and all yes. the they'd give away a, yes. a freezer or something, uh, an appliance. And encouraging. About the time the electricity was coming to the farm. Encouraging farm. people to live modern in the country. Mm-hmm, <laughs> mm-hmm. You had an inside bathroom. You had to go to town. Yeah, yeah, such a difference <laughs> from, from the... From, uh, Today, when people in the countryside expect that they should be able to live at least as good as their yes. neighbors in town, I, and that didn't used to be the case. That's, that's right. That's absolutely right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
Now I, I think I want to move over to your political involvement. Oh. <laughs> uh, who are your political heroes? You know, you, we've talked about cooperatives, but uh, who are the who is the people that caused you to think about getting into politics? I a couple of South Dakota natives when yeah. I was younger, definitely Hubert Humphrey, mm -hmm. Huron boy, went to Minneapolis and went from there and just totally. You you could sit and listen to him for the hour talk, you know. Mm -hmm. George McGovern, yeah. uh, still alive today, uh, very instrumental in making believe. I can remember helping do a toast and roast for Tom Daschle when he ran for the house. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know why they called me to do that, but I was on a program in Highmore with Eleanor McGovern, mm -hmm. neatest lady you ever wanted to be around. These kind of people influence you and in what you... Uh, you think in politics, uh, yeah. uh, I guess as a kid, I can remember as a child, I can remember my dad being so happy when Franklin Roosevelt was elected president. Mm -hmm. and, it, and rightfully so, because then he created uh, uh, Public Works Administration so that they at least had some work. Everybody in the, in the country was broke. Mm -hmm. Bread lines, we didn't have bread lines because we didn't have any bread. <laughs> and uh, you know that I can remember that as a little guy, you know, and not even thinking about whether he was a Democrat or Republican or what they were. But I can remember Franklin Roosevelt. But he, yeah. of course, you just you those kind of things. But after I got older, I think that probably, uh, like I said, Humphrey and mm -hmm. McGovern and people like that. I served with Dick Knipe. Yeah. Uh, very interesting governor. He uh, was concerned about mm -hmm. little people. Sure. Uh, and they, I, you, you, but yet, people said, how do you get along with people across the aisle? You know, some of my best friends were across the aisle. I'm not kidding you. Mm -hmm. They just, and I, we worked together and we done some things yeah. together. I can remember Bill Grams from out to the Sturgis mm -hmm. area. Him and I were good buddies and we didn't have the same political beliefs at all. Yeah. Yeah. But we done things together and mm -hmm. worked together. Uh, that was uh, him and I. He told me it was something I didn't have to worry about. It. I could trust him. Yeah, yeah. There's, it seems like today that uh, for some reason or other, there's a there, that that uh, collegial relationship is not quite there well, anymore. I think that the South Dakota State House is like a morgue. Yeah. I don't know. I couldn't understand that when I go out there. I still recognize the lobbyists, but I don't recognize legislators. Yeah. Uh, I, we were always happy people. We disagree and you know on the floor and do that. But when we left, we were a family again. I, mean, I don't think I see that as much as I used to. They yeah. wanted to go to your room and you're hiding from the public or something. I don't yeah. know what it is. I don't know. I don't get out to that much anymore. But I I can sure feel it because. Uh, but I, I've told some of the lobbyists, I said, you know, they made a mistake. I said, you shouldn't have put the limit on the legislators. You should have put the limit on the lobbyists. I felt that way. I took uh, my own limit. I got out of there. Yeah, <laughs> no kidding. I said, you know, the, you had 10 years for a legislator. There's lobbyists that are there in a day, and I haven't been there for 30 years. They're still there. 50 years. Yeah, oh. and I'll tell you what. They have a great influence on freshman legislators mm -hmm. because they know the ropes and the... Yeah. Uh, you yeah. definitely need a class for new legislators to, to, to not warn them. Leg lobbyists are a useful item if you use them right. Mm -hmm. But they have don't, an agenda. Yeah, no they, gotta, they, are, they, they have an agenda. Oh, absolutely, and they're trying to try to promote it. But you can ask them for information. They should give you good information. Yeah. But you don't need to take information from no. them. Ask for it. Don't mm -hmm. let them deliver it. <laughs> Maybe collect the information from more than one lobbyist yeah, oh, yes. on an issue. Yeah, well, yeah. that that I see out there. I just uh, and I notice the thing that probably startles me. Our state is we don't gain population a lot, but I just I maybe I am wrong. But I just see more growth in Pure today than I do any town around here. Mm -hmm. More employees for state government or what? Yeah. I don't understand that. And we continually build in prisons mm -hmm. that I that I never. We we have twice as many people, nearly twice as many people locked up as North Dakota has. I yeah. don't think we're any worse people in North Dakota. Honestly, I don't. Mm -hmm. Our judicial system, there's something wrong. And they're thinking about building some more prisons. I mm -hmm. said, wait a minute. You've got to have some people who are not violent. You ought to let out with a leg iron or something and let them work. Mm -hmm. Instead of keeping them locked up. They don't. You don't get nothing out of a person that's locked up except the yeah. expense. Yeah. 
Yeah. And I know some that need to be locked up forever, but I, there are some yeah. that don't need to be locked up. And, well, there's always a lot of non-violent criminals that. Uh, oh yes. Uh, that but, are serving time. Yes, it, it just it, there's the woods is full of them. Mm -hmm. They're thinking about building one rapid city now. You know. Yeah. Well, there's uh, been some talk over in Huron that well maybe we could have a prison. Uh, yes. The college campus there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, really? that's that's too bad. Yeah. yeah. What years did you, you served in both the House and Senate? Yes. You, what were the years that you were in the House and then the Senate? Well, I served the first two terms in the House. Uh, I got out in, well, stop and think. I, I'm, I'm saying 70 till 80. I mean, that'll be awfully close. It's yeah. all written on that. Yeah, letter. and right here. The, uh, the I served in the... Minority in the House. I, yeah. I, I done something unusual. That mm -hmm. I don't think any legislator ever, another one I haven't heard of any that done what I did. Yeah. Uh, not that it was anything on my part, but I served in the majority in the House, and the minority in the House, the majority in the Senate, and the minority in the Senate, and done it all in eight years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the majority side we had, when I served in the House, my second term, I was chairman of Natural Resources and Ag Committee. Yep. Uh, in the Senate, when I went over there, we had the majority, and the next year we were the minority. So, but today it's so lopsided it isn't even funny. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, you can see the uh, the results that we have here from not having really a two party system in the legislature, and you know. Yeah. Um. What were the what were the key issues when you were in the legislature back in the 70s uh, that you remember? I think one of the biggest key issues, and I never had any problem voting for it, is I think we have the most antiquated tax system that mm -hmm. ever put in, in the country. Still do. Yeah. Uh, it's amazing to me that you pay sales tax on everything. Yeah. And so if you're a person that makes from 15, 10, 15, 20, 25,000 dollars a year, Six percent of your wages go to taxes, pretty basically, mm -hmm. whether it's for your sewer or your water or your groceries yeah. or whatever it is. Yep. Uh, they charge and charge and charge. And most towns have the two on, so you get four to the state and two. Mm -hmm. But if you're if you're over the hundred thousand dollar mark for income, you can invest in some stocks. You can buy some things that don't have tax yes. tied to it. So you got a plus gain. So you. Your your tax and your income is not as heavy as that poor person, mm -hmm. and you can go to Arizona in the winter time, and the poor person's got to stay here and pay tax year round. Yeah, probably lives from paycheck to paycheck. Yeah, barely making it. Yeah. See, and that's the thing that I I voted for, and I wouldn't care. I never hurt me any. I voted for every income tax bill that came. Mm -hmm. I said I don't know. I don't think any of them were probably perfect, and certainly yeah. the tax system we get out today is not perfect. Mm -hmm. But I think that people that make a lot of money should pay a little bit more tax than they pay now in South Dakota. Yeah. And How, I, why do you think it is that uh, that the uh, that so many middle and low income people are so defensive of rich people when it comes to putting together a tax system? That I don't think know. it ought to be that the rich person is persecuted unless he can pay the same percentage uh, that they do. I, I don't know. When I pay federal income tax, I've paid some in my lifetime. Uh, I never complained when I yeah. when I paid it because I knew I made some money that year. Mm -hmm. I had a couple of years or three or four when I was on the farm didn't pay none. Yeah, and we had a bad year. We didn't have any money to spend. Mm -hmm. But when we made money and we paid income tax, I smiled because I knew that I'd made some money that year. Yeah, uh, uh, I you can't have good roads. You can't have schools. You can't have mm -hmm. that unless somebody pays some tax. But I don't think poor people ought to pay at all. Yeah. Yeah. Or a bigger percentage of it. I shouldn't say all because everybody pays some tax. I understand that, but some people get a better break than poor people do. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, uh, uh, anymore today, you can't even get the Democrats to talk about tax reform, yeah. let alone the Republicans. That's right. Uh, I did. I never. We had Dick Knipe when he was governor, yeah. stressed income tax, and he was elected again. I said, uh, I said, I don't know why that the banks in South Dakota pay income tax. Yeah. 
You don't hear them complaining. Mm -hmm. They pay six percent of their net. Sure. Insurance companies. Yeah, and they pay. Income tax. Yeah, they pay yeah. it through tax. They don't hear them complaining. So if you get a certain amount, of the banks don't pay anything. They don't make any money. But if they make money, they pay. They pay their franchise tax. They call. They don't mm -hmm. call it income. They call it franchise. Yeah. Well, maybe that's what we ought to do. We ought to call it a franchise tax here instead yeah. of an income tax. Yeah. Uh, you were uh, you were in the legislature when the Family Farm Act was passed too. Yes. Yeah, uh, parts of it. I mean, they were some yeah. later than that. Yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. There were there's some additional things yes. done later on, but in yeah. 1974, and that uh, was involved in I think maybe some additional bills being introduced in yeah. previous years before yes. they finally got enough to to pass that. That was just before I went to work for Farmers. Yeah. Yeah. yeah the. Uh, yeah, we had some positive things. I can think of some positive things. One of the things that we had, we got rid of personal property tax mm -hmm. when we was there. That and was that was, tonight, yeah, it? Yeah. and it was supposed to always go back to the schools. And I think they've kind of got away from that now. There's about $40 million there that they were supposed to relieve. Mm -hmm. I called it a liar's tax because if you did, you said whether you sat in good chairs or apple boxes in your home and if your wife had a diamond ring, you were supposed to list it. Mm -hmm. And the only ones that did that was a poor person. The lady sure. that couldn't hold her hand up with jewelry didn't list nothing. Yeah. Yeah, and if you were a farmer and you heard your personal property was out there for everybody to see. Ooh, yes, to yeah, your tractor and your cows were walking around out there, but you could, I think it was a lot of people in, in $100,000 homes were sitting on apple boxes when you looked at their personal property tax. <laughs> yeah. So that was a bad tax that was glad to see it go. But the replacement should have came back properly to the counties for that too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Were you involved in the railroad issue too? When, yes. When the, uh, uh, the state... The state got involved in it. I, uh, in fact, I had a person, our transportation manager in Harvest States, I had him fly down and testify to a committee. Mm -hmm. Because at that time, Bill Janklow wanted to buy some rail cars, 10 of them, to keep track of. And I said, that's the biggest waste of money we could ever have, $6 million. It was going to be, I said, you cannot keep track of 10 cars. Mm -hmm. I said, if you try to tell the union what you're going to do with those 10 cars, I'll tell you what's going to happen when they get over someplace in Minnesota. They're going to pull them off the side and say, these all need new cotter pins, and you're not going to move them until you put them in. Yeah. So you start telling them what to do with them. I said, we had we had seven or 800 cars in GTA at that time. We, were, mm -hmm. we had no idea where they were at. <laughs> You, they were gone, you know, but you yeah. used cars. It was a pool. Mm -hmm. So you put 10 cars, that's like peppering your eggs. Sure. Well, anybody who has ever sat at a, a railroad stop out in the countryside watched cars from all over the country right. go by. <laughs> yeah, they, you might get a car and you might, it might wind up in North Carolina and you might have seven other ones in Montana and two in California. I said, oh. there is no way you can keep them together. You can't, you try to tell the union how you're going to do them cars, I guarantee you, you're going to have a problem. Mm -hmm. And so I had this fella come down from the cities and talk to him, and we got that killed. Mm -hmm. uh, we've The state put money in and bought some rail, you know, to get it going. It was yeah. a good thing because it was going to go to pot if we didn't. Yeah. And, and we do, what we did do wasn't really fair in a sense, but we never heard we put a tax on truckers to pay yes. for it. Yes, yeah. So yeah. they were the one that subsidized the railroad. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, you weren't in the legislature anymore. This is a relatively more recent issue, but I thought I'd just kind of get your take on it, and that was the sale of the state cement plant uh, and how that was done during a Christmas holiday period with, without any opportunity for public input. Uh-oh. It's telling you something wrong. It's telling me that my battery is... Uh, done, huh? Getting close to being done, Yeah. Okay, well, okay, all right, well, we're going to have to endure a little bit of that, I guess, just to, that'll be all right, I think we'll, hopefully, yeah. okay, uh -huh. I don't know why it's doing that. Okay. All right. 
You might want to move her back a little further to the east, huh? Yeah, it may be that I need to move it over here a little bit. Okay. No? Okay. Is it going to be alright now? Uh, okay, let's... Hmm. I'm going to have to look at that before the next time. Okay. Hmm. Okay. Uh. Okay. I think it's going to be all right now. Uh we don't have too much more to uh, to cover here. Uh, what uh, what legislative accomplishment were you the most proud of? I think uh, that you were actually able to get done. There were a lot of issues. Obviously, you would have liked to have got. I done. think helping repeal the personal property tax because Lars Hurstis and I were on a committee that. Ironed out the difference between House and Senate on that, and Joe Burnett and Aberdeen was one of the, I can't remember the other two mm -hmm. gentlemen on what we were on that committee to try to get the difference. We got them ironed out, and uh, when we was doing all that, we also, <laughs> Lars and I, were trying to get the tax off of food. Yeah. <laughs> and that's something I think that they should, still should do. Because mm -hmm. uh, that's one necessity that people have to have is food, and not yeah. restaurant food. I mean, I'm talking about in the grocery store, and yeah. not the napkins and the stuff like that, but the real groceries. Mm -hmm. And there isn't any reason they couldn't do that. And the last time it failed so bad, I don't understand. I think they blew up the amount it was going to cost. And yeah, yeah. Well, they seemed like they had a, a dog and pony show every week or every yes. other day with a community that they had the... Yeah. And I, I was kind of disappointed to see them recruit even the Democrats, the local Democrat officials, to participate in uh, that. Well, it's... Uh, poor people got to eat. You know, and you, I'd rather see another penny or two on restaurant food than yeah. uh, make it decent so you buy a gallon of milk. I said, you go down here and buy $10 worth of groceries and you're 60 cents and you do that three times and you get another half gallon mm -hmm. of milk that you throw yeah. away. Yeah, and we're completely, with the exception of Wyoming, surrounded by states that do not tax food. Yeah. Uh, it's, they haven't done it in North Dakota since I was in the, like the seventh or eighth grade. <laughs> and it, they get along okay, don't they? Yeah, they do. They do. They're about the same size as yeah. we are. Uh, almost getting to my wrap-up questions, uh, and, and I think you may have covered this question a little bit uh, earlier on, but uh, what changes do you see in your community today as compared to earlier earlier on? You're now living in Miller here yes. instead of out uh, on the farm at, uh, at Wessington, but... Uh, well, the, the change I can see and not change I can mm -hmm. see in Miller is an older community. Yeah. Uh, that's true all over the state. Yes, I think, with that rural schools, population. The schools or enrollment goes down a little bit and mm -hmm. get cut down state aid. Uh, I'm sure I can I can look out the window of my house and see seven widows. Yeah, now yeah. that's you know I can see where seven widows live. There's a widow lives in that house. You want to see there. There's a widow, lives there. There's a widow <laughs> lives there. There's a bachelor lives there. There's a widow yeah. lives there. Yeah. There's a widow lives right there. So I'm surrounded by widows, and that's mm -hmm. not a good sign. Yeah. Not, I'm not surrounded by kids. I've got yeah. family right here that's got three or four mm -hmm. children, and that's the only one around me. Well, right across here's the other house, but most of them are retired or single person mm -hmm. living in a big home. Yeah, 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 yeah. And we need some type of industry, clean industry of some kind to encourage growth in little communities. And yeah. how, how do you find it? We're, we're a long ways from anything. The transportation just kills you if you mm -hmm. manufacture anything. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and it becomes a difficult thing in funding education when you're dealing with a population that doesn't have kids anymore. That's right. And yeah. getting them to, you, take, to, to do what may need to be done. You get less state aid, there. you still have to have the teachers, yeah. but you get less state aid. And so yeah. we just got out of an opt-out, and the only reason we did, we got the West, did quit, and mm -hmm. got something out of there. But in a year or two, I'm sure we'll be right back again, just with, have to opt out to get some more yep. money for our school. Yeah, yeah. Are you optimistic or pessimistic as you look at the future? 
considering everything that's gone on out here. What do you think needs to be done here in this part of South Dakota to, to make things uh, uh, better in the future if that's necessary? I think a couple of things that I can see recently that I hope gel and go on like they should, mm -hmm. especially, well, for instance, in here on the two plants, let's go to the new plants. If, if uh, I, I'm confident that we ship corn and things out of here that could be fed to livestock, and if you can get brand identification on beef mm -hmm. to go through that plant, I'm sure that there's a plus plus where you could get a premium for it. I want that yeah. beef plant. I I feel bad to the day reading it where there's a, they're on hold for a little while now, you know, because of mm -hmm. contractor backing out yeah. on them or something. Yeah. And that's too bad. Hey, uh, I'd like to see it get online because there's a lot of good cattle around here and they yeah. raise corn and beans and there's no reason you can't feed them here, butcher them here and sell mm -hmm. them at premiums if you got if you can keep them identified. Don't mix yeah. it in with Brazilian cow beef and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. Uh, restaurants still like good meat and I don't care if it's in New York or San Francisco or where it's at. Mm -hmm. if they'll charge more but they'll serve a quality product, you'll buy it. Yep. Yep. And that's the positive thing I see in the railroad. Mm -hmm. I definitely want to see that go through. And that's a plus for them, too. If they have to ship any of this standing beef on a boxcar or refrigerator car mm -hmm. going out of here, they got some way to take it out of here in a hurry. Yep. Yep. And I think that'll help this community, the Huron community, Wolsey community, Cavour, all the little towns around it'll help them. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, it's it's more positive. I, mean, I think one positive thing you got like Alpina with the jerky plant, yeah. but the only trouble you have with some of those smaller ones is that the wages are not like they ought to be, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. You get a lot of uh, uh, imported people to work at them, mm -hmm. uh, but your top job should pay good. I mean, I yeah. Just, I mean, that's hard work, and it's a shame that they don't pay better. Yeah. I, I I think it benefited the community like Huron back when the when the plant, the jobs at Armour were amongst the best paid in yes. town rather than the that poorest. That and the railroad too, because they had a railroad yard there yeah. too. And then, then railroad employees got paid really good. And they spent their money there. Mm -hmm. So they could build a good home and, and have a good life. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Later on, you saw uh, nothing against the immigrant uh, population, yeah. but you saw them uh, on Saturday morning sending their money home. Yes. They weren't spending it in the local community. Yeah. And yep. that was. And maybe they would have brought their families and settled down if there were good wages. Yes. Oh, hey. yeah, yeah, you see, I'm sure that you go into a town like that, you'll see a lot of money orders processed. Mm -hmm. And that's not the way you, you make a town grow. Yeah. Uh, I know that, uh, not to say anything against it, but the union came up to the to this place there. And I, you know, I have nothing against unions. I think they're important for working people. Mm -hmm. uh, they had people tell them in there, well, you might lose your job if the union comes in here. That's not a good way to run a business. Yep. If they, you need to protect, you need good hospitalization, you need mm -hmm. a decent wage. If it doesn't generate it, then you ought to quit. Yep. 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 Well, I tell you what, I think we've covered the waterfront and we are uh, uh, almost two hours, like I told oh, you. Oh, yeah, well. <laughs> okay, so I think I'm going to, I think I'm going to, I think I'm going to, I think I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna,